So, good evening. Um, thank you to the organizing team for getting me here to Aarhus, and espe I'm especially grateful for uh, the timing of the conference to bring us to Ar Aarhus when it's really the sunny side, the bright side of Aarhus, which I experience. And there is so much light even at, at seven o'clock in the, at this, after this long day. Uh, I will not show pictures. After all, it's, it's a conference on sound. But I will not play sound either, because <laughs> I will talk about what is implicit in sound. So I will resist to play sound. Um, but then you hear sound, which is, of course, um, the sound of my voice. For a moment, my thoughts have been frozen in form of this text, which I printed out much more than the electronic version, a print version freezes thoughts for some seconds or minutes or days. Well, in the aeroplane, I, I updated it again because I, I proceed from the text which I've published in a book. Now, you, you, you hear me now. I'm not a, I'm not a sound artist. I'm 100% academic, no doubt. But um, I will express some risky thoughts, and this is the experimental, the more artistic part of my, my, my talk. Mm, as expressed in the abstract to my talk, this talk is not intended as a contribution to so-called sound studies, but uh, I want to turn upside down the notion of sound in order to reveal below the apparent auditory phenomena, the deep epistemological essence, which is an articulation of specific temporalities. Therefore, implicit sonicity, how I call it, in order not to confuse it with sound, will be addressed, not simply to make verbally, like I do now, explicit what is already articulated in sound art, but rather to reveal the hidden implications of sound itself. While sound as acoustic vibration is a physically material event, in its temporal form, its implicit sonicity, which affects the human sense of time, is, it is volatile and immaterial. The almost immaterial sonicity of electromagnetic waves make sound matters not simply a phenomenon in acoustic culture, but a fundamental event of being in the world. This involves the asymmetrical relation between sound as signal event and music as code, which is turned upside down with digital sound, which is the mathematization of sonic matter, and thereby suddenly a re-entry of the musical, the coded element, into the sonic signal structure of sound matter itself. Now, I'm proposing a figure which cannot be uh, narrated as cultural history of sound ending with digital media, but things return which have been excluded for a long time. Like the, like the phonograph, the signal recording has excluded the musical score for a long time. But surprised and unpredictably, the score returns when we are coding the computer. Now, this is a temporal behavior which is not, can it not be explained in terms of a history of sound. According to Norbert Wiener's um, seminal cybernetic a uh, cybernetic definition, information measured in bits is neither energy nor matter. So if we are concentrating on sound and the materiality of sound, we are still living in what Norbert Wiener would call the 19th century age, where, where matter and energy was the central agenda. But the challenge is how to think it in more informationally. But um, to underline at that moment, my central question is how does sound as matter relate to its immaterial temporality? This is, as you guess, a truly Bergsonian question. And the answer to this Bergsonian question was given by uh, Gaston Bachelard, who answered to Bergson 
in his 1950 writing, which has been translated as the dialectics of duration. And I give you just a little quote. And you see why I claim Gaston Bachelard as an ally of my argumentation. Quote, rhythm is imprisoned in sound boxes. When we see a rhythm preserved in a radio aerial, we cannot stop the image of a reciprocal action between the geometric and the temporal from intruding into our thought. It is therefore in our best interest to regard things as truly the products of stationary waves. Periods are spatio-temporal functions. They are the temporal phase of material things. As it vibrates, a thing reveals both a temporal and a material structure. Now this is almost the words by which I want to address the temporality of sound, which is the implicit sound, the sonicity. Now, coming back to the um, challenge of the bit to the sound as form of energy and matter, maybe the current interest in sound and our assemblage here is already an, a symptom of what is nowadays called the post-digital, a nostalgia for the vibrational matter. Different from music in the old Pythagorean tradition, sound cannot be reduced to an aesthetic, discursive, political, ideological construction. The agency of emancipating sound from music has been media epistemological indeed. It has been signal recording technologies and media theories, avant la lettre, which heightened awareness of the physicality of sound as vibrational event, both mechanical and electromagnetic. Whereas the ancient musical harmonic tradition looked only at the uh, ratio, the intervals, the spatial intervals between um, when you plucked the string, not the vibrational event counted, but uh, that you can cut it in half and then you have uh, mathematically whole numbers. So this was a geometrical listening to the sound in the, in, in the interest of mathematics. In early modern modernity, suddenly the actual event of the vibrating string, Marcin and others, was, was discovered. But then this became countable in the name of frequencies. And once you can count sound in frequencies, you can retranslate it to the numeric, and then the computer can take over again. So it's a battle between the, the mathematical in sound, the mass mastering of sound by mathematics, and the temporal event, uh, which uh, it somehow eludes um, the, uh, the easy mathematization. In terms of ontological unrevealing, it is technological analysis, such as spectrography and fast Fourier analysis, which matters as a better understanding of sound than human hearing itself. Does aesthetic experience come to existence only in human perception? This has been addressed in several talks here already. For the media archeological ear, the musical structure does not already unfold in silent decoding of the score as claimed by Theodore Adorno. He, he heard the music. He said, I just read the score and then I get all the music. Um, but the emphasis, the media archeological emphasis on, on materialities on the one hand and the logical on the other hand, it's not simply nostalgia for the hardware it's taking into account the mathematics, the logical as well. And this is the hard edge of media archeology, span not to be confused with research and interest in dead media and things like that. That's the soft media archeology. span But the hard edged, intense media archeology span cares about materiality on the one hand and the mathematical challenge on the other, which adds up to the word we use, technology. Techne, the hardware side, logics, the mathematical side. Both has to be taken into account. And uh, the media archeological ear listens to the operative implementation of sound in structurable matter. Like the computer is actually, it's not 
it's, it's putting mathematics into matter and only by that mathematics can start to operate. It could not operate when you list it only and write it down on a piece of paper. Then the piece of paper does nothing. And I'm already alluding to a, a guiding hypothesis of mine um, that the operative media which we are used to in media culture have a structural affinity. They are twins of musical pro of sound and sonic musical processes. There is a structural affinity between high-tech media and the unfolding of musical and sonical processes because both are regulated unfolding in time. They share, that's the essence of both. So two worlds which are very often kept apart unite in this, on this deep level. Neither acoustical nor music theory prior to the 19th century conceived of sound as material. Instead, music was thought to consist of tonally moving forms as it was expressed by Eduard Hanslick in mid 19th century. Only when a musical score is decoded and incorporated into human performers or implemented, like informatics says it, into signal processing, mach processing machines, it can be articulated as sound. Music is the semantic content of organized sound, as maybe Vares and Cage would half agree. The message of the vibrational medium is the experience of time. So I, I make a difference, very much McLuhanite, between the content of sound, which is very much the apparent acoustic experience we make, but the message of sound, the, that's what makes it so epistemologically interesting, is that it addresses us on the time level. And since we do not have a time organ, we have five senses, but we don't have a time sense. But the sense which comes closest is, of course, the ear with the highest resolution of microtemporal uh, processes. So that's the sort of the, 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 the essential message of sound. It addresses uh, the time sense. Musical time, which exists as well, is the organization of a set of forms imprinted on sonorous matter. Musical time is symbolical time. It is just symbolical. Whereas, of course, in, uh, when we talk about sound, we mean the actually physically really implemented time. And the third level of time would be the imaginary time, which is something like cultural history or so. Of course, I follow here Lacan. His differentiation between the real, the symbolic, and the imaginary can be exactly mapped on the existences of music, sound, and then cultural history of music, maybe. Music is sounding matter shaped in symbolically ordered time. Music is the, what ancient Greeks would call the drama. That's what the, the dramaturgy of. You have to, f to, to, to impose a certain order on events. That is drama, that is the musical part. But the, the actual time event itself is then the sonic event, which is the signal, not the symbol. It's the signal. And for most physicians, the signal is automatically the time signal. So we, we, get sort of, we come to the essence of where does time actually take place? Because sound does not just unfold in time, it constitutes time. That is a more radicalist uh, reading of it. In discussing the essence of the tone, the philosopher Hegel once defined it in its temporal essence. In German, he says, or he writes, he defines the tone, ein Verschwinden des Daseins, in dem es ist. A disappearance of being while it exists. Now, he captures exactly the, the temporality as the, the essential event in a tone or in sound. And once more, this equals technological and high technological operations where electrons are the material form of time. While, uh, well, the, com the commonality of sound, vibration, light and technical images lies in their equal condition as time critical frequencies. There they are equal on that level, on that parameter. 
and there all our saying audio, visual, things like that, that vanishes. That only makes sense for the human senses. The existence of sound in time and as time is twofold. There is its explicit temporalities or temporal realities in human perception, and there is its implicit dynamics as epistemic object, as object of knowledge, worth to be researched academically. The privileged alliance between technological events and musical sound is based on their common denominator, which is its temporal processuality. This is evident in a central electrotechnical device, the resonant circuit, otherwise significantly called tuned circuit. Such an electric circuit, which is in the core of most of our electric devices, consists of an inductor, well, we have seen it a bit already in a lecture today. There is an conductor and a capacitor in mutual connection. The circuit can act as an electrical resonator, an electrical analog of a tuning fork, storing energy oscillating at the circuit's resonant frequency. Resonant circuits are used either as sender for generating high frequency signals at a particular um, frequency actually, yes, or as receiver for picking out a signal at a particular frequency from a band of carrier signals, particularly in radio technology as we have uh, seen in the brilliant tree radio lecture today, up to the mobile media in digital wireless communication. Now, there is no even if we are in a digital world, the resonant circuit is active in our digital devices. In an experiment around 1889, David Lodge placed two resonant circuits next to each other, each consisting of a Leyden jar connected for energy storage, connected to an adjustable one-turn coil with a spark gap. When a high voltage from an induction coil was applied to one tuned circuit, creating oscillating currents. Electric sparks were excited in the other tuned circuit without direct mechanical connection when the circuits were adjusted to resonance. Now that took most experimentators by surprise. It was a fascinating experiment, but uh, it was very difficult to explain in the mechanistic uh, uh, physics up to those days. Not by coincidence, technical engineers borrowed the term uh, to describe the microtemporal event of oscillatory electromagnetic discharge from musical science. We have the, the resonance. I mean, they, in order to describe the temporal event, there was in culture just the language of music who offered a time addressing language and, and the technical, the engineers borrowed it. So this is a symptom. Lodge and some English scientists preferred even the term syntony, syntony for this effect, but the term resonance eventually stuck. When Marshall McLuhan once daringly termed what he called acoustic space. Well, then what he declared thereby is more fundamental than what the human ear can hear. As the radio producer Tony Swartz in the 1970s wrote in his book, The Resonant Chord, and he was an active radio program man in New York, quote, in discussing electronically based communication processes, it is very helpful to use auditory terms like reverberation, tuning, etc. So we see this structural affinity. So sound, if we do research and in, if we inquire into the nature and the, the time essence of sound, this is not just a contribution to sound studies. That's a contribution to analysis, analysis of media culture itself. In his book, The Audible Past, Jonathan Stern differentiates sound as perceptual quality from mechanical vibration as physical event. Quote, as a part of a larger physical phenomenon of vibration, sound is a product of the human senses and not a thing in the world apart from 
humans. He actually does not like harmon, I suppose. Sound is a little piece of the vibrating world and somewhat human-centered, as Stern explicitly writes. But some conditions must be given for something to become recognized, labeled and valorized as audible in the first place. Vibration encompasses both a dissolution of matter as well as sensory experiences of things which vibrate, as Shelley Trauer expresses it. It mediates between subject and object. To quote her once more, vibration, not itself a thing or matter, can move simultaneously through subject as well as objects, bridging internal and external world. Vibration operates before being translated into sense data as sound, light, heat, let alone language or image or sign. According to Steve Goodman, which now has to be mentioned, of course, the vibrational force is an in-between of oscillation, the vibration of vibration, the virtuality of the tremble. Vibrations always exceed the actual entities that emit them. Vibrating entities are always entities out of phase with themselves, how Goodman defines it. Well, then we come to tactility. Tactility is the mode in which sound can be experienced by humans as vibration. Actually, that's what our eardrum experiences. Different from the electromagnetic field for which we have an organ, but our radio organ is the eye because we can perceive electromagnetic waves by seeing. And this is our radio. And this is, electro this is waves and, it, and we can receive them. But it's in so many ways completely different from the vibrations which we mechanically uh, perceive by our ears. Because the light does not mechanically enact pressure. Uh, not really. <laughs> Maybe if it's as bright as now. <laughs> the English noun sound, and I'm really impressed by all the Danish colleagues and students and they talk English with us all the time so we can hear be together and that's great. But there is of course a problem. Most of our native language, and there are many nationalities here, have a rich variety for expressing what is here subsumed under sound. For example, in German, sound rather splits into different notions. There is Schall, which is the physical acoustic air pressure, which can be perceived by the human ear and hearing. But there is Klang, which names the periodic harmonic sonic events. So to subsume both under sound in an English translation undifferentiates it. Sound excludes noise by most definitions. But noise now is integral to communication theory as we know. Sound, therefore, is too limited in its epistemological scope, the very notion of sound. That's why sound studies are somehow limited. They, they deal with noise, but they, they, there is a sort of occidental tradition of an ongoing battle to exclude the noise, even if it's made a subject in the name of sound studies. The notion of sonicity includes noise as the stochastic alternative to music and there I'm ally of Yanis Zenakis, of course. And in, sense, in terms of electronic music, subtractive sound synthesis creates order from noise, filtering frequency bands, like actually the Indian music concept of an all-encompassing drone ambience, which is continually present throughout and from which music can be extracted, subtracted, different from the traditional Occidental Western additive notion of sound building up from single harmonic proportions or waves. Additive music builds up sonic events synthetically with the bass being silence, whereas subtractive musical concepts actually begin um, from the 
co-presence of all aspects of sound. Here, all the notes and possible notes, not only the notes which are being played, but all the possible notes as well to be played are present before the musician even starts playing. This even extends to the concept of non-struck sound, like the theoretical fiction of vibrational forces called ether. Ether is an interesting theoretical fiction. This vibrational matter, I mean, this has been an obsession for 2,000 years. And everybody knew it doesn't, it, it's impossible to prove that it exists, but uh, theoretically it had to be invented because it was imperceivable that communication can take place across uh, the vacuum, that was impossible. That's, that's why Aristotle had to invent the fifth sense, the ether, which until, 19, until Einstein in 1906, it existed. Now this is an interesting vibrational matter and existence of sonicity. Um, sonicity refers to the specific temporal knowledge, which is implicit within sonic instruments of analysis and synthesis on the one hand, and to graphically or mathematically derived sound on the other. At this point, the semantic associations of sonicity might start to get misleading. In 19th century discussions of the nature of, of electromagnetic phenomena, acoustic terms have been borrowed. For example, James Clark Maxwell's notion of the electronic, uh, electrotonic state is another, borrowing from the realm of music for the new high technical uh, uh, operations. The electrotonic state Tonic, this, pre uh, this um, tension is the same word like the tone in Greek meaning. The tone means tension. And suddenly it returns in the electromagnetic field. This is quite an unexpected term in the history of vocabulary for sound events in the Western world. It had been Christian Heuchen's undulating theory, rediscovered by wave synthesis today, which equaled light to acoustic waves, resulting in the literary media theoretical fiction of the ether, which I just mentioned. So we see, of course, the, um, the light waves don't behave like the acoustic waves. It's, it's, as I pointed out, completely different way of physical existence. Uh, but it's interesting how, how on the epistemological level, this borrowing um, of the acoustic or musical terms had to be there in order to describe processual events because the language of visual arts could not describe the processual events. Now I will not talk about theater and the performance art or media theater and things like that because this is in between. By the equation of electromagnetic waves with elastic mechanical vibrations, uh, one should always be aware this is just a heuristic model to gain metaphorical evidence of an otherwise uh, completely different kind of events. Maxwell's caution, Maxwell is himself cautioned on the otherwise useful analogy between light and the vibrations of an elastic medium. The epistemological challenge is in the cultural dilemma of articulated sound, be it oral poetry, spoken language, or musical, on the one hand, and sound is very material in its very material physical air pressure, which hits even violates the human ear on the other. The Berlin Club Transmediale Festival in 2015 last year theme was untuned and therefore was exploring sonic articulations in terms of direct bodily effects and other sensory stimuli. I think if this is subject, a theme of a, of a avant-garde music festival, it indicates the irritation and maybe even the retro effect. We are living in a high frequency electromagnetic wave dominated world and everybody accepts it in its own pocket with all the devices and the, the New York uh, Stock Exchange does it with the high frequency trading, etc. So it's all happening. Now suddenly as a retro effect, there is an interest in the bodily sub infrastructural, infra sound like uh, uh, violence or physical sound. Um, I think this is a counter reaction. This shifts the focus from the symbolic and cultural semantics of music to questions of physical sono affective forces. Sound moves in between musical meaning, what does it attempt to portray 
and media communication. What effects do sound and frequencies have upon us? As has been expressed by Martin Calais, sound now, this is a direct quote from his uh, forthgoing PhD, sound matters. It mediates between the real and the virtual, connects the physical reality of acoustics with the mental reality of the muses. But even if the affective potential, uh, the, what the end of quote, but even if the affective potential of sound is clearly a focal point, yet it constitutes only one aspect of an investigation into the distribution, modulation, and perception of frequencies. Let us therefore liberate sonicity from sound. With the traditional distinction between noise, sound, and music being increasingly blurred in artistic practice, the concept of the sonic as an overall category transgresses the limits of the musical and the acoustic and opens into the spectrum between bioacoustical field recordings, brave brainwave and Trainment, binaural beats, biofeedback, psychoacoustics, noise, and sub bass vibrations. Such vibrations are delicately moved matter. Even if sound is, to human perception, the most immaterial form of matter, still it is different from the electromagnetic waves which touch the human eye as really immaterial light. Sergei Eisenstein was wrong when he asked to remove the barriers between sight and sound. And that's why I'm such a critic of terms like audiovisual media. Of course, Chillon has expressed this more deeply. In terms of harmonic relationships, there might be a symmetry between the visual and the auditive. But in terms of electrophysics, there is an epistemological asymmetry between mechanical violent vibrations and electromagnetic waves optophonic listening to the sound of visual patterns by sonification rather obscures this fundamental difference. This is, of course, a critique of many artistic experiments in early 20th century when the invention of the sound film uh, as light inscribed and can be then sonified by the photocell triggered a lot of those optophonetic uh, experiments. All kinds of waves are a form of energy transfer without physical transport. That's an interesting thing about the wave. It's not the thi things which are transported by a wave. The energy is transported. There is a radical difference between mechanical and electromagnetic magnetic waves. Acoustic vibrations are among the most immaterial articulations of materiality, but they are still on the side of matter. matter. Not only can physical matter be forced to vibrate, but as pointed out by Henri Bergson, matter itself consists of vibrations that is implicit sound. Matter, and now I quote directly from Henri Bergson, Matter and Memory, quote, matter resolves into numberless vibrations all linked together and in uninterrupted continuity, all bound up with each other and traveling in every direction like shivers through an immense body, unquote. But sound relates to matter only in the acoustic sense of mechanical vibrations. The oscillation of the electromagnetic field are different kind of sound. Let us therefore undo this tight, the tight sound matter coupling in favor of a more processual time critical notion of sound as signal event. When propagated in a physical medium channel like air or water, sound is the most ephemeral form of matter. Itself, it has no solid materiality, but is matter unfolding in time. That would be my straightforward definition. Matter here becomes a temporality or a temporeality, like an analog electronic image, which the video artist Bill Viola once described as the sound of one line scanning. He defined the electronic image, the video image, as sonic or sonicistic, I would say, in, in essence. When physically propagated sound is being technically transduced, this is not simply a linear translation, but it changes its essence from sound to signal. Within a telephone line or when stored as magnetic charges on a tape, a media epistemological 
transubstantiation takes of sound has happened. Now I borrow a term from whoever is familiar with Catholic liturgy knows the transformation of Christ, of the, of the piece of bread into Christ's um, flesh is a highly educated theologically transubstantiation, but something similar happens. Um, since as such the audio event becomes accessible to signal processing, but it's not in a sound state anymore. The audio signal beyond its possible origin in the physical world may come into existence by electronic generation exclusively in electrotechnical autopoiesis. The real essence of sound, such as in electronic dance music or drum and bass, is not primarily bodies, but electrons in periodic motion. As human composition or mix or mastering, it is still musical, while the sound itself has been decorporalized completely, neither connected to a human performer or voice nor to a mechanical instrument any longer. What started with the electronic live recording and studio editing now has become the message of the electronic and algorithmic that is truly technological medium itself. The primary difference between, and we discussed it yesterday, the Paris studio of Musique Concrète, PHFR, and the Cologne radio studio of electronic music created by von Einem is not simply an aesthetic, but a media epistemological one. Recording and manipulation of physical sound versus electronic sound generated by sign tone generators from the beginning, from scratch, but scratch is a bad metaphor because that would be again on the Parisian side, that would be the phonographic side. Pure sonicity, only the sheer sine wave as elementary unit, uh, it exists only in electronic devices. That fascinated young Stockhausen. In nature, you cannot find a pure sine tone, but, but electronically you can get at least very, very close to a pure sine tone. Now this is completely different. This is genuinely electronic music. The sonic signal exists on the electronic level only not in the physical world of mechanical vibration. Thereby, electrons, the essential element of electronic media, are themselves accompanied by waves. Now, another twist. Erving Schrödinger intuitively in recalled the oscillation, the oscillating monochord of antiquity, and thereby defined implicit sonicity. Quote, suppose the electron in the hydrogen at atom is analogous to a string tied at both ends. Now Schrodinger describes the monochord of Pythagoras in a musical instrument. Such a string emits a very definite tone together with its overtones, but not the wavelength in between. With this idea in mind, so far Schrodinger, Schrodinger set up a wave equation for the electron. Now this is really the level of sonicity. It's not about what we can hear, but, it's, it's, but again, the, the musical and sonic metaphors have to be borrowed to describe essentially temporal microprocesses. And even to describe the only true radio, which is radiation. Hearing is based on the very touch of sonic waves. Therefore, the acoustic dimension of media may seem as the very extreme of tactility, an audio tactile space that McLuhan conceived as defining mode of media culture. In this space, there is no fundamental distant view as in vision in this acoustic space or sonic space. The temporal equivalent to the audiovisual um, tactile is immediacy. The time form of the immediate is very much tied to this idea of a sonic temporality as, a, as different from the distance in the visual realm. All changes, and yesterday, uh, when we heard the archival tapes from the Pierre Schaeffer uh, studio, we all recognized that we react to those archival quotes, all we, although we know it's half a century old, they are present. They are present to our ears. Our ears treat it as if it was played right on stage. Whereas when we saw a quote by Schaeffer's publication projected as a beamer, there was no problem to keep the historical distance. It was immediately perceived as historical. 
that we can cognitively digest as historical, but the sounds from the archive, even if we know it's historical, our uh, sort of hearing mechanism has a different temporal awareness of it, and it's radically present. It's immediate. The, uh, yes. All changes when sound becomes transduced into an electric signal and thereby modulates a radio high frequency carrier band. Electromagnetic waves do not mechanically touch the human ear. All the sound is there, but unhearable. The implicit sonicity, how I call it, of electromagnetic vibration, closer to light and um, actually close to ultra short radio, radio transmission. That is why Claude Shannon, in his notorious diagram of communication engineering, makes a difference between the technical re reception and the final understanding of a received message. The ear becomes an electronic receiver with the brain being the final destination. But the electromagnetic event is not material anymore, but an epistemological challenge to rethink sound as matter. It can only be phenomenologically observed by its effects or needs mathematically be or diagrammatized. That's another way of coping with the inaudible sonicity. But when sound carriers change from technically extended writing, such as analog phonography, to calculation in digital computing, this was not just another version of its materialities, but a conceptual change. The, and here I reconnect to my initial argument. Since music as cultural art form does not belong to the sonic realm, since it is primarily conceptual, symbolic. From there, exactly from this stems its affinity to early computer music, which reintroduces the symbolic code after generations of analog sound recording, be it the phonograph or the gramophone or the, ma the, the magnetic tape. Once the analog audio signal becomes, becomes digitized, the term signal processing only makes sense. It becomes fully justified in terms of computing. Coded in binary values, the signal within computing devices shall not be called audio signal anymore, even if it can, by digital to analog conversion, be emitted via loudspeaker for human ears as sound again. What phenomenologically appears like sound has in between, in the technological media channel, gone through a complete transubstantiation. And I might stop with this sentence here. In digital media, we have lost sound. I, I had much more to say, but I rather would prefer that we can have a sharp discussion on what I said. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much. It was um, really, really interesting. A lot to <clears throat> digest at the moment. Um, are there any questions now? Or? Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering how you uh, evaluate that uh, transubstantiation. Is there a, yes, a value attached to that um, in, in its uh, change mm. from one form to another and back again? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to borrow this term from, from the Catholic liturgy, um, it, it's a highly elaborate theological theory about this concept. It isn't as easy as it sounds but to, maybe to people in, in, in the liturgy. And the, the idea that um, there is no, not, it's not just a linear continuation of sound then in form of electricity and then becomes sound again, like most people might have perceived traditional telephony or something. Um, the, 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 um, when, when, when the acoustic signal becomes elect an electromagnetic event, uh, an essential change takes place, which is as dramatic as the difference between the analog and the digital, in a different way, but it's an essential change. And this, I wanted to address this. 
it has another form. It has another form of existence. It exists in a in a um, in a form which can only, in its time form, be equal to the to the acoustic signal. But but in its essence, it's is a completely different matter or even non-matter. It, it was a big challenge to to early electronics to say how can it be that a, a pendulum physically behaves the same way like uh, the resonant circuit with, with the two bouncing back and forth of energy, stored energy and... Con now, it's completely two worlds. Even nowadays physics has no supermodel to unite these mechanical events and the electromagnetic events. And still it behaves if you mathematically analyze the temporal behavior, are the same. This is one of the, the biggest puzzling epistemological challenges to, with, with what the 19th century was confronted and has still not yet digested. But actually, this is something where all the cultural knowledge tradition did not prepare us for, for the electromagnetic field. That is something that took, that took uh, European and Western knowledge by shock, and it still uh, has to be digested. And now, the different temporality with it, which is attached to it, um, that's one of the core things I, I want to discuss with you. Um, because um, uh, with all this interest in, 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 in Whitehead and in other concepts of processual physics, um, what is the alliance between the, the sound and, and our sense of time and uh, does, does it depend on the acoustic sound, or is the sonicistic, the sonicistic time forms, which are electromagnetic time forms, or other or quantum physical time forms? Um, how, do we have to radically extend the notion of sound um, to, to these realms without getting metaphorical? So, but the, what, when I say epistemological in the beginning, the, the kind of my, my, my neologism of sonicity tries point at the fact that there are different ways of discussing sound. I want to discuss it on the level of knowledge. What is a sound as a knowledge object? That is the literal translation of epistemological. And what and, and this level is, is focusing on uh, the, the temporal event and the question of temporality. Because in the end, um, if, if our sense of time and sound is so tightly coupled, with digitization, with the mathematicization of sound, we lose the time, the temporality. We do. And the reproduction of an algorithmically coded sound loses its historical index. You, you still need the, to, to, to keep the hardware running, and if you lose that, then you are reminded of historicity, no, no doubt about that. But, 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 but the essence of the digital sound, it becomes mathematical. And mathematically, you could write it down even with a pencil. You don't need a high electronic. And it can be transmitted across millennia like that. That's how we could receive alphabetic text from the antiquity. We, we read platonic dialogues. Why? Because the coding, the coding technique of the alphabet made it possible against entropy, against historical decay, against the decay of paper and parchment and whatever it is, we can re we still receive this knowledge. And that happens to sound the moment it becomes digitized. The moment the, the temporal event, the time domain of sound is translated into the frequency domain, which is our digital sound culture, then we switch the temporal mode or we even lose time. That's the epistemological level where I say an essential change takes place. That's a transubstantiation of a dramatic kind. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, is it so? Yeah, it's on. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, incredibly rich talk. Um, there's a couple of things that I would like to raise with you. Uh, the first is the notion of transubstantiation, which yes. you're borrowing, yeah. <laughs> which in, in a liturgical, um, you know, it comes from a, a liturgical tradition which has at, at its base uh, a trinity, which is, you know, the uh, Catholic trinity. Uh, th there is no transubstantiation without a trinity. 
and the Trinity is in itself, you could say, a kind of a logical, uh, a, lo a kind of a epistemological and logical concept that um, really has no bearing outside of a certain religion and a certain sort of historical context. So I'm just wondering if key concepts like transubstantiation and the ether also that you mentioned, which is also a very, um, yes, it has a long history in, uh, say, the atomists, you know, sort of uh, the, um, in, in Greek philosophy, in terms of the different, not necessarily the ether, but it does have a long history and has been adopted, um, you know, in terms of uh, not just uh, the ethernet, for instance, but, uh, you know, the early 20th century when there were notions of, you know, the ether and electromagnetism and so forth. So it has a kind of historical context there. But um, so, so these two concepts, the uh, transubstantiation, which goes back to a historical context of uh, a religious notion. Uh, the ether, which is also a kind of, has, has a kind of historical context there. Uh, but the, 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 I guess my main question is, to what extent is notation, music notation, to, to what extent is your theory of mapping, which seems to me a kind of a mapping of um, the acoustic or the sonic onto the electronic circuit or the digital or whatever, um, to what extent is music notation uh, a part of that? And then how do you account for, or to, can you account for, uh, pre-notational musics or non-notational musics or the difference within music um, yeah. that accounts for, for instance, uh, you know, uh, what are they called? Um, you know, effects in music in, and uh, long scored uh, particular sort of, you know, rhythmic, um, accents and tonal accents and so forth. Yeah. So both in old music, ancient music, and in more contemporary music. Okay. So to the first part, what's more transubstantiation, transubstantiation, and uh, ether? I noted down no more metaphors. I will I will delete those words in my text because <laughs> uh, there is a risk. There is a risk. I want to I want to discuss these subjects, which involve heavy ontological philosophical questions as close to technology, technological knowledge as possible. Now, I see, once one introduces the, such cult, metaphors like, then very often the audience jumps in and then it becomes a, a cultural discourse the discussion. Because then, then it becomes a cult, cultural knowledge question of discourses, of traditions, and so. But that, then we miss, well, then I missed my point. Okay, I will just delete it because I don't want to defend to what degree transubstantiation is able to describe what actually engineers really did describe by transduction. It, it's just that I want to say, let us look closely with philosophical eyes at what transduction actually, what is happening there. It is as dramatic and as ontological as theolo theology discussed for hundreds of years in the name of transubstantiation. Okay, the, the, the other point was on the uh, musical notation. Well, I tried to differentiate the musical and the, the sonic, of course, and, and, and even the, the sonicistic. The musical exists as a part of the alphabetic, alphabeticized culture. Now, and, and not only that it is notated, but it is discreetly notated. That's the our tradition of the alphabet, as opposed to graphical notation. Graphical notation is of, of a completely different kind. That is maybe, but the, 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 the idea of the musical score for a long time had been um, part of the alphabetic culture, up to the point that that my, my, my late colleague Friedrich Kittler, he wrote his last books, Aphrodite and Eros, on the a happy short time in Greece, in ancient Greece, where the same code was used to write down music, language, and mathematics, all in the same alphabet, which, he says, recurs in the alphanumeric code today. Suddenly we live with our computers again in a, in a culture which codes music, language, text, mathematics in the same uh, system. And um, I separate that from the physical inscription of vibrational matter, 
which becomes recording because every record as opposed to the discrete musical symbolic notation where no time happens a, a form of graphical notation is of course the phonograph or the phone autograph of Leon Scott this was invented not for replaying music or preserving it for the future but, but for analyzing for writing down the signal event of sound that was how the phone autograph was invented Scott just didn't think of it one could replay it Edison thought about it because he had to finance his research himself um, so uh, and the experiment with graphical notations like 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 um, by um, uh, modern companies uh, they they are they are a different question the, the the symbolical code detaches the musical symbolical regime from the physical event from the time event and even in the computer which we perceive as a very much as a time machine it can reproduce sound and according to the sampling theorem it can faithfully reproduce an analog signal that happens in the computer but if you look closely what happens in the computer nothing happens in the computer which comes close to sound nothing it's discrete steps it's an alphabet it's an alphabet which is processed in time but there is not a human reader of this writing there is the Turing machine it reads it itself and that it's being retranslated into something which sounds to us by a via piezoelectric devices as sound is just is really peripheral to the computer so in the the essence of sound does not reside in the computer anymore because the digital processing within the computer essentially is uh, is not sound and that that um, that makes it so dramatic because no not many people see the con digital music culture popular music by computers as a continuation of electronic media an escalation of electronic media culture but it is it is that there are that i learned from michel foucault to look at the discontinuities and the, the discontinuities are the more they are the more dangerous or even no, well, what, uh, I'm, I'm not paranoid but um, they are more dramatic <laughs> or we should be more suspect more critical about those discontinuities because they are not apparent they, they, they are just to us to our ears we cannot really differentiate a, a, a highly uh, frequency high frequency highly sampled signal from the computer from from the classical high, high, highly high quality high fidelity audio signal like, like in images as well. Humans cannot decide, but it is essentially two different things. And this is, becomes a new challenge to our culture, that uh, our senses, they are not reliable anymore, anymore uh, when it comes to those time, time processes. There is a, time, a world of time unfolding and happening which we are too slow to remark. Our time sense is too slow to remark this. But on the other hand, to put it more positively, because I sound a bit now sort of paranoid, but um, uh, may I mention that my other book just appeared, Chronopoetics, to look closely at what time events, what plurality of time poetics happens on the most technical level. The micro plurality of time forms which unfold and every day happen in our microprocessors or in other analog electronic media deserves to be discovered for the old philosophy of time which is one of the oldest questions which concern human beings now to discover this form in technology enriches our philosophical culture of how to think time and being and now we come to we could always but i stop here uh, because I did not mention Heidegger, although he uses the word tuning, Stimmung, is so essential. We don't exist. We, we are tuned to existence. That's why he describes it in, in, in this uh, processual way, the being. And, and, he, and he describes it in words, if one looks closely, Stimmung and others, this is sonic terms. This is sonicity in the most elaborate uh, philosophical sense but that would be a, a lecture of its own to, to reread Heidegger in its implicit sonicity
Yes. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, thanks a lot. Um, I have a maybe slightly naive uh, question, and I must admit I'm perhaps more interested in time than in sound. Um, you speak of, of sound as signal, but then uh, sound as matter unfolding in time. But then you also say that, that sound doesn't only unfold in time, it constitutes time. Mm -hmm. um, and my question would be, uh, is it only sound that constitutes time, or does time also come into being through uh, other phenomena than, than, than sound? And also, when you when you refer to uh, Schaeffer uh, and uh, the lecture yesterday, you, you say that we have an, another temporal awareness of sound than of uh, uh, writing, for instance. Yes, another uh, temporal awareness, but then it seems as if you prioritize uh, presence. But that's that's yeah, of course that's that's temporal, but but it's but it's it's not sort of time in itself uh, presence. I can understand that sound. Has some kind of of, uh, of uh, mm -hmm. I don't know privileged way of producing presence, but 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 constituting time itself. Uh, could you sort of elaborate on that? Mm. Yes, thank you. I think that time itself is less plausible as an expression. I I used to be. I, I'm a trained historian, and then I became a, a, a critic of the historical discourse. And now I've become a time critic. And that, it's not just I investigate time critical processes, but I become a time critic. The, the, the unifying signifier, time, is totalizing something which a lot of others as well have said. That at, at least we have to treat it in, in radical plurality, plurality. So there are only times. And I've come to the point where I see that the notion of time, because it's so semantically, so heavily loaded, like the ether, we have, like the Einstein, we, sh we, have, we should dare now to think about getting rid of the word time. And because time itself might be a sort of semantic symptom for, to catch processualities which can be described in other vocabulary. And for that, I'm happy that I'm close to technology because engineers supply me with a wonderful terminology. Things like we use uh, uh, temporary words like like just now or say we, we say this every day. Now you could translate, you could find an electron technical equivalent to all those time expressions which we use in our everyday language, like the delay line, which for color TV was so important. You delay one signal slightly, some microseconds against the other, so you introduce, you slow down a bit. Or real time, the real time computing, which 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 um, we thought about the past and the present and the future, and then there was even then there is suddenly the, the the future and the past is there, which we know from grammar in school as a temporal mode. But the computer does it all the time because that's the essence of what real time computing is: to predict via Markov chain based probabilities coupled to statistical values what is the most probable event to happen, and you don't have to know all the past in order to better predict the future in the strict, uh, simple Markov chain, just the, 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 the immediate previous state is enough to, to predict, to anticipate the next one, and to make it happen so fast that we, using such real-time machines, think we are always in the present, but we are not. But to describe this without using the word time would be interesting because it would liberate us. It would get us closer to what's actually happening. And so uh, what is the, the, the generative epistemology or, or reality uh, which is behind what led, once led to have word, to, 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 to invent a word like time. And I want to remind that the Greek f f music theoretician, the rival of Pythagoras and uh, a, a, disciple, uh, a disciple of Aristotle, Aristoxenos, he radically pluralized time, Kronoi. He, he spoke about times already, tightly in his discussion of rhythm, of prosody, and intervals. And, um, so there, there is a plurality, and we might even dare to, to um, 
get used to a language uh, which undoes with time and uh, without missing. I'm not postmodernist and not, I'm not sort of saying it doesn't exist, but but it exists in the plural and we get it better if we describe it in a different language. And for that, technological language and informatical language can be very productive and helpful. But if you read this with philosophical mind, that's why I say, that's, that's how I try to teach actually media studies, uh, why, why I'm so happy that I'm at the humanities faculty. Although most things students have to learn first makes them think they, they are in the, in the computing department or something. No, the closer you get to technology, but as long as we read it, decipher it with philosophical questions in mind, and we are suddenly fascinated by some events which happen within technology, and they make us question and wonder like the early Greek philosophers wondered about some things in nature, and that's how started philosophy. Now most engineers, most people in the computing department, no, most programmers don't have the time to develop these questions. Uh, or maybe they don't have the interest, I don't know. That's the, the privilege and the duty of humanities, and that would be a strong reading of what digi then digital humanities, or algorithmic humanities, how I prefer to name it, makes sense, this term. I would still try to, let's, let's fight for a better usage of digital humanities before it gets too banal and then we have to distance ourselves. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for this talk. This is totally fascinating. So I want to ask you, uh, so sound studies. So the way that you divided up music from sound, from implicit sonicity, from then the, I guess, what happens with the shift from analog to digital, right? They have a series of, of kind of um, shifts. So sound studies looks, in the way that you're describing it, it's a very interesting characterization of sound studies. Sound studies seems like a kind of discipline that can only be nostalgic because it's unable to understand, comprehend, articulate the nature of the digital, right? Because sound is not happening in digital computing, right? Yeah. There's a kind of, it's an alphabetization, it's an encoding, it's a symbolic encoding. So music, in a way, right, this broad expanded notion of music that you're talking about is what's happening at the level of the digital, right? So if that's the case, and this is a very interesting critique of sound studies, I'm always curious about what critiques of sound studies people are making because it seems like there's actually so few of them out there, right? So many people are so enthusiastic about it. Um, so if this is a critique of sound studies, then are you advocating for a kind of return of music studies? Is music studies the proper kind of study, uh, you know, I mean, it maybe conjoined with media archaeology, is music studies the proper kind of study to be able to understand the nature of the digital and its impact on implicit sonicity and sound and music. Yes, I think we, we need, since I, I, you brought it right to the point and um, I couldn't have expressed it better. The one element is that we have, we should look with philosophical curiosity at, at the events I've been describing, the most technical events. But the other is we need knowledge as well. It's not enough to have just curi philosophical curiosity. If that, if that is combined with a firm knowledge of which nowadays would need technology and computing and musicology to know the deep implications of uh, our cultural vocabulary and their refined knowledge which musicology as one of the oldest disciplines of asking about time processes or processuality that is the oldest discipline we have which inquired processuality. And this uh, sound studies might be grounded more directly in musicology, or musicology should claim that <laughs> that would be the place, but then they have to do it, of course. Uh, um, and, <laughs> and, and it's not that I'm, I'm it's so. We are, we are now running into an open door. Sound studies, I don't, I can't dare to be a bit more ironic about or critical about sound studies because it's there. I'm happy that it's there. On that level now, we can discuss to say what, what, what's the next step because now it's established. And uh, that, that would go into the direction. And um, yes, thank you. Um, I, yeah, I, I just have a question. And that's... <laughs> Um, I, I need to ask this question. 
Um, because it, it, it deals with... Um, um, you, you, you talked about um, the difference of the, the difference between uh, the electronic music studio of uh, Stockhausen and Chauvet's uh, um, Musique Concrète, and, and, and you said that uh, Stockhausen's sine wave generator was pure sonicistic. That that this pure um, sine tone is somehow not uh, it, it's not sound, uh, but it's the the, the sonic. Is that yeah, it would it, at least it, it decouples the idea of sound and electronic sound from from the natural acoustic world because yeah. because it doesn't sound. exist. It, 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 the, the sine tone doesn't exist, can, can only be produced in its near ideal form by electronic hypersensitive. Yeah. Uh, but sorry. yeah, and so then the, but, the following but, question is that because it's, it's this sine tone, the perfect sine tone doesn't exist and it, it can never exist. And especially when you take into account the, the sine tone generators that Stockhausen used at that time were far from the perfect sine tone because of various temperature um, issues and so on. So it, it wasn't a, a pure sine tone. And also, I mean, you can, you can have a theoretical, mathematical sine function. Mm -hmm. That would be the pure sine. That, that's, but but, but, that, but that Stockhausen the didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So that was, I mean, is that then still the, the sonicistic, uh, pure? Yeah. Well, Herbert von Einem, who actually founded the studio, he, he wrote about the pure sign tone. It was coupled to the early cybernetic information theory and models. And uh, so um, everybody would, at the, even at that time, admit immediately that uh, it's, it's dependent on temperature, so it's, not the, it's only the near-perfect sign tone. But there are two things. It, it comes not from the acoustic vibrational world, but it comes from the electromagnetic uh, world, which is a different world. And this world produces something which is as close to the pure tone as the point of which we know there is no mathematical pure point. But this is a long discussion. This is one of the oldest Braxonian discussions as well. And Leibniz solved that problem. He said with his infinitesimal, if the aesthetics of the infinitesimal calculus with Leibniz and his Baroque thinking, which fascinated Deleuze so much, is you don't actually have to prove that it's the ideal. You come as so close to it that you can treat it as if it was. That's the, 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 the limits, the limit, that's the whole essence of the infinitesimal uh, differential equation. That, that it, it's, and Cantor did it with mathematics as well. You can suddenly treat infinity as just one number, and then you can calculate with infinities. So things like that happen. And then his Turing, his, his discussion, his invention of the Turing machine, is the byproduct of a negative answer to the question, what can we not calculate? He invented the computer by saying what the computer cannot calculate. Now this has become uh, the most powerful medium we, we use. So things like that happen. And I, I, when I read the texts by Young Stockhausen, how he is so, He's enthusiastic, and I, I was once, again, when I was a student, I, I read it with similar ears, that, that the, it, 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 he could, he, the, those strange electronic measuring devices, which were normally, they were all invented for radio repair, not for producing music. But this liberated him from the constraints of the acoustically bound idea of the tone, and of the sonic what is addressed to the ear. The, 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 within the electronic circuitry, the sound tone exists in a form which nobody hears. And it is, it's not acoustic, there is no address to it, but there is an implicit. So the time form of the tone is there, but in a completely non-acoustic and not even sonic form. That's why I try to name it sonic, sonicistic. And uh, so, um, yes, it's as radical as that, I think. Yeah. Mm. Listening to this discussion really reminds me of what Wolfgang Hagen wrote about radio and said that 
it was the same argument that, it, you know, that the internet doesn't radi radiate from a central point, there are no sparks or waves, and so that the internet was not internet radio. And then Sabine Bretzmeuter also wrote in regard to this, argued that it, it was up to the listener how they decided what it was in the end. So I think we could perhaps try to try and just keep this, this argument that you raised, which obviously scientifically it could be seen that it's, it's not being, you know, it's, 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 it's not reverberating and it's a different thing, but at the same time, when we listen to it, we are, it's our interpretation, that, you know, as Brett Moy has said, that makes it what it is. Mm -hmm. Well, Wolfgang Hagen is certainly one of the most epistemology oriented media scholars of, of radio and, and, and uh, the family of waves, uh, for sure. Uh, and uh, the only, but then in the end, there is a, I, I have an ongoing discussion with him on, on one question is, are those technologies like radio, the inquiry about electromagnetic wave, Heinrich Hertz and others who didn't think about radio, but they inquired about electromagnetism and things like that, from that resulted radio. Now, is this a product of discourses? Is it the setting of the 19th century set of questions, what people were interested in, made them construct such experiments, Hans-Jörg Reinberger and others, history of science is very much into this laboratory production. Then, then, then knowledge becomes, in a way, a historicistically relative product of discourses of times. I am more media archaeological in that sense. Media archaeology has a different sense of equi, well, equi originality or something. That, 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 let me put it in a musical example, because we are here at the Sound Art Matters conference. We have, I mentioned two or three times, the Pythagorean monochord, this one string instrument which was used as a laboratory instrument. It was never used to play music. But it was a musical instrument was used to inquire the question, is there something like a mathematical order, in, in harmonic order in, in, in the world? And the medium by which the Greek early scholars tried to answer it was via music, interesting enough and by pulling the string and subdividing the string. Now, all we, although we know more maybe like in 18th or 19th century, how much far away we are from the Greek, ancient Greek cultural mind setting. I mean, our grandfathers maybe thought they were very close to the classicist tradition and things like that. No, we know it's, it's difficult. We have to say it's, it's a different culture. It was a different culture. But there's one thing, once we are coupled to the medium, we can do this experiment, divide the monochord into two halves, and then the octave resounds. And then the argument of Pythagoras is not historically dependent on the discourse and culture of his time, and then it becomes replaced by another discourse. It just happens like this. And that, from that I derive one insight, that once we are coupled to media knowledge, to the implicit knowledge of media themselves, it is, can be reinvented, reenacted in a way which undoes with the historic gap which separates us from the early experiment. And that is something, the resonant circuit functions nowadays in your mobile phones, it's di different, the, the modulation is different, of course, but the principle that happens like in early in, in mid 19th century when it was first discovered. Now there's something radically non-historistic about it, and that's why I say media technology is in a different temporality than cultural history, or it is at least partly in a different temporality. And that's why I'm a critic of the history of technology, or, or even of the social, what is it, T TCS studies, uh, who, who, who say that each technology, technological knowledge is a product of the, of the social and uh, discursive construction of its time. No, media do something and they do it exactly and we can even re reenact it. And when it comes to music, it's, it is really surprising how much we can reenact it and we can, and that, 
gives us access to a different deep tuning into time, uh, which time tunnels the temporal historical distance. I, I see this is a fascinating project. How, how, I'm not saying we are, it's at the end of history, we, but we might get used to a different way of addressing what we call the past. History is not the only way to address the past. Via media, we can do it in a fascinating way. Yeah. Um, I have a. I was a little bit surprised about your comment that um, uh, only with computing, uh, with digital computing, the notion of signal processing makes sense. Um, I was thinking in particular about um, uh, analog computers and their importance in actually calculating. No, they are not calculating. Analog computers, they function like, a, like an analog synthesizer. We, we, we did a workshop in, in media studies at Humboldt University, where normally, for, for music lovers of popular and that electronic music, they know the synthesizer. That's the only, especially the analog synthesizer is even gaining more and more analog days. And then, in history of technology, something like an analog computer as a sort of dead end of computing is, is remembered. They are twins. It's voltage controlled. And with the, the fascinating thing about the analog computer, you sonistically do mathematics. You don't calculate. You don't, you don't have algorithms. You don't have discrete numbers in analog computing. You have, you have a voltage. And you multiply voltage. And you do a differential equation. And they do it immediately. With the speed of electricity, you can do a simulation. The word simulation in computing arrived from analog computing because it does it immediately. Now everybody who plays, who uses an analog synthesizer knows all that. And he knows as well that temperature can distort the results. That was the biggest problem of analog computing. Analog computing, because it, it functions exactly like, a, like an electroacoustic synthesizer, but it can be used for mathematics, which is a non-numerical mathematics. Um, you patch it like a synthesizer. You don't program, you patch. And it does it immediately. But the, the, the degree of decision, uh, precision was a problem. You can only have a certain degree, degree of precision by, by tuning the knobs of an analog computer. And then it heats up and the currency and the capacitors. Now, and the, the digital computer, which was much slower at those times of analog computing, it was much too slow to do real-time simulations. The flight simulators were all analog computers because the simulation only makes sense if you can react to it uh, in, in real time. But then, with the speeding up of the, uh, of the microprocessors, uh, of the digital computer, this temporal lag was diminished, and the precision can be extended un to almost unlimited way. That's, the, the, that's the, the advantage of the digital computer, that you can be as most precise as your processor capacity is. And when it comes to processing, I think you, the word processing, well, we talk about microprocessors, the, the algorithmic computational processuality as one of these post-time forms or alternative time forms is different from the way, like we heard it today, uh, the sound of, of a paper is transduced by a pickup into acoustic, electroacoustic vibrations which arrive our, at our ear. But because the, 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 the transduction is, there is more linearity in this than in the complete abstraction which takes place by turning signals into symbolical numbers, zeros and ones which makes it accessible to mathematical intelligence, which you cannot apply to a, to a pickup. And then it's retranslated again. Although to, to, our, to the end, to our ears or eyes, it might look very similar, but it's essentially, once more, essentially it's a different thing. And so I would reserve the, the word signal processing to point at the delicacy of the algorithm-based signal transformation or, Whereas, to keep it separate from the analog transduction, and, but I discussed it a lot with engineers, there's no clear usage of the word. But my, since I'm sort of, yeah, I'm professor of media theories. Now, I cannot really improve technology. I'm not, 
good enough for that. But my job is to care how we use the words. I mean, that is the humanities, what they can do at least, and when they can help our culture and the engineers to think twice about certain words, to discover the beauty of the words, like the resonant circuits, which engineers use without feeling especially poetic about it, but I say there is so much knowledge poetry in it, and to be more precise, to, for example, to separate real time from life and things like that. It's completely different time worlds, and it makes sense to be precise. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you'll have many more. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm really excited about this talk for, uh, for many reasons. Um, uh, I'm excited about the, uh, this notion of, um, of this time disappearing because uh, I, for one, am completely ready for the annihilation of time through sonicity. Uh, it, because I'm late for everything anyway. Uh, so that's, that's a huge advantage. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm only allowed to ask you one question, I think, to be fair. Um, so uh, something that, uh, that I found really interesting that you were talking about was, of course, you know, we know that the part particles versus waves, this is, this is you know, a hundred year old thing. Um, so, the fact that it changes in some essential way um, was very interesting to me in terms of, in your terms of, of bits, which of course there is there is no music inherently in these in these bits, for instance, in these compressed um, bits of, of data that we then perceive as sound. Um, I'm curious, on an epistemological level, what it is that uh, that you do with these bits, however. Um, when they are residing uh, within the computer, but there is, for instance, uh, no sound card present, um, no speakers, and, and so forth. Um, yes, well, I, the, 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 the particle versus waves is a, is a discussion which is more central, of course, for, for physical science, but the equivalent I wanted to point at was the dramatic change which takes place from the time domain to the frequency domain. Although we can treat the same what we, sonic event as a waveform and we can read it as a frequency, uh, that's, but the, the possibility that we can calculate, computate it, is dependent on it, that it's possible to, to read it as a, in the frequency domain. Uh, at the same time it loses its temporality, its temporal existence. And the temporal existence has to be reintroduced by, by windowing and things like that. The, the Fourier analysis, the biggest problem is that he has an ideal signal idea. And he cannot <coughs> treat with the decay of the signals, the Fourier analysis. And then, then Gabor starts with, and then we have wavelets and things like that, and quant acoustical quanta. Um, but but this, is, uh, this is silently replacing music as a time-based art, or, or the sound events as a time-based art, by, by what can be calculated, the frequency domain. And although this is two sides of one coin, it epistemologic, epistemologically radically changes the, uh, the status of sound. And, and that's, in that sense, we, we, we lose in a productive way time and sound in compu computation. Uh, but it's productive. I don't see it pessimistically, or I, I'm fascinated that culture moves forward, knowledge moves forward in a dramatic way, and the media know it already, but we should know it as well. So, <laughs> I try to help. And with these final words, uh, thank you so much, Wolfgang Herr.